mercy and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Just a quick show of hands if you don't mind. How many of you made New Year's resolutions? Wow. Like normally I see like at least a third of the car. You're like, nope. <laughs> been there, done that. Or wait, been there, hadn't done that. Nope. 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 Well, you know, it's a. Uh, I. It is January 6, 2019. And I don't know if I've said my New Year's resolution out loud or not, but um, I'm going to go ahead and say it now. I have resolved to go to the gym at least one time in a week. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, provided I'm not gone somewhere doing something else or, or sitting on the couch. Um, why do why do some of us apparently none of you why why do we make New Year's resolutions? Probably because we want some kind of change for the better. Something that in 2018 we said you know we probably should do this. So now we're resolving that we are going to do this in the new year ahead because you know it's a near new year, new me, new you. Let's let's go do this new new thing. I mean after all. It is a brand new day, and as William Shakespeare once wrote in the, uh, by the evil Sebastian in Act 2, Scene 1 of The Tempest, he said, what's past is prologue. What's past is prologue, meaning simply this. What has happened up to this point is simply set the stage for the glorious transformation that's going to take place. Awesome. Uh, so New Year's resolution is a promise that we make ourselves for ourselves. Regardless of what resolution or goals you may commit to, the goal to improve life in the coming year, resolutions can come in a lot of forms. Some people make a promise to change a bad habit, such as quit smoking or eat less junk food. So why do we make these promises? I think it's very simple. It's motivation. It's motivation. You resolved to do it, now you need the motivation to go and accomplish it. Motivation. You know, I'm kind of curious. What motivates you? What actually motivates you? I put this out on Facebook a couple days ago. And uh, by the way, if you see Facebook posts by me, just know that I'm sermon prepping. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I, I put out a Facebook post and I said, in one word, what motivates you? And I got, actually, I think it was like 37 responses. I'm not going to read them all to you, but here's, if I, if I try to narrow them down, this is what it comes up with. It says, uh, people wrote, let me see if I can find it. Ah, family, love, joy, hope, responsibility, coffee, <laughs> pie, reflection, sunshine, and literally, the comments, these two comments about what motivates you were literally back-to-back -back on my Facebook responses. Jesus and revenge. Back to that in a second. Not too long ago, um, I was helping my daughter with some math homework. Yes, I was. I was helping my, my daughter with my, some math homework. Now, here's the deal. I don't know how you did it. it in your house, maybe right now, or maybe parents growing up, but Marcy and I have decided to divvy up the subject matters when it comes to homework to make sure that we're really the experts and sticking to, you know, sticking in our lanes. Okay, anyway, um, it's 2019. All right, um, so, uh, so Marcy does things like, you know, like language arts. She's really good at language arts, and I get to do math. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm good at math. That just means that of the two of us, I'm the one that gets to do math. And so I was helping Annabelle do some homework, and she was doing fractions. Everyone remembers how to do fractions, right? And in order to solve the problem, we had to find the lowest common denominator, right? What do all these things have in common and what the common denominator was? So what does this have to do with anything? Upon reflection, I feel that when it comes to New Year's resolutions or motivation in general, the lowest common denominator of our motivation 
comes down to two things, love and fear. Love and fear. These two things are powerful emotions, powerful things that drive us to do a lot of things in life. These two words describe what really matters to us on the deepest levels of us. These two words are deep causes for why we do the things we do and why we don't do the things we don't do. Today is Epiphany. And today, in the gospel story from Matthew chapter 2, we see all the forces of both love and fear at work in these short 12 verses. As I was reading scripture this week, I was struck by and began wondering what in the world motivated the Magi to travel all that way from a land so far away, simply following a star that they saw at its rising. Now, I said Magi. Just FYI, the original language of the New Testament is Greek. And the Greek term Magi is actually plural for the original term Magus, which Magus does not mean king, but a member of the priestly caste in the Persian Empire. So we're going all the way back to ancient Persia and people of a priestly caste. They were Zoroastrian priests. So in short, these people were sorcerers. They were sorcerers. They were astrologers. Maybe they were smart, but they weren't kings. The Magi first came to be identified as kings, probably due to the association. Did you notice from our first reading today, Isaiah ch chapter 60, verse 3? It says that, they, that kings would come and worship the Messiah. You can also see a connection to Psalm 72, verses 10 and 11, with those identified, those people who came from a far off land, identified them as kings bowing before the Messiah. Maybe they earned the title wise men for their skills in interpreting dreams and understanding astrology. After all, Zoroastrian priests were well known for telling fortune telling and preparing daily horoscopes. They were scholars of their day and enjoyed access to the Persian emperor himself. Zoroastrianism is one of the actual oldest religions of the world, which is still active today in the country of Iran. It was actually the official religion of Persia before Islam. So what motivated these priests, these sorcerers, these individuals, whose gifts numbered three, but whose real entourage numbers are unknown, what motivated them to go to a destination unknown, into a region filled with people who did not share their same skin tone? It was not their home religion. It was not their home country and they wore different clothes, what motivated them to journey, to make that journey? In a word, I think it was love. They loved the knowledge and the search for truth. And when you're looking, searching for knowledge and truth, it really doesn't matter how, go, how far you have to go to find it. And it really doesn't matter if the source is a wrinkly old person next door to you or a wrinkly baby boy who lives in a far off country. When you're searching for knowledge and truth, the messenger isn't important, only the message. And the message of a king being born right under Herod's nose leads us to the other form of motivation, fear. You see, Herod just wasn't called Herod. Herod wanted to be called Herod the Great. Ah, how many of you would like to have that next to your name? Awesome, right? Vic the Great. Right? Travis the Great. Irma the Great. Right? That's awesome. You know, usually though in history when we look back, people who want the great following their name are the people who usually wind up doing anything they can 
to ensure their power and greatness are never threatened. So when the Magi come from afar, following the Epiphany star, looking for the king of the Jews, they show up. The star is there. It doesn't say, you know, one single beam of light. Bing! There, there's Jesus, your destination ahead. No, that's not what happens. The star rose up, and they're kind of like, okay, we're generally here. Awesome. So where do you find a king? Well, it makes sense and logical to go to a palace. Let's go to a palace. The nearest by palace to Bethlehem in Judea is King Herod's palace. So King Herod, they go to King Herod's palace. The nearest one was there. And throughout history, throughout history, kings have had sensitive noses to snoop out anyone who might challenge their authority at some time in the future. They even have murdered their own sons and daughters if offspring gained too much influence over others. In Herod's case, it was not that the fact that the child had been born that presented the problem. The threat to Herod was that the possibility of future conflict. What would happen when the child grew up? He heard from the wise men, these magi, that this is the king of the Jews. Well, that's the region he rules. What worried Herod is that he saw trouble down the road. He knew a baby couldn't do anything, but a grown man could. So he acted accordingly. He pulled what I like to call a Barney Fife. He tried to nip it in the bud, right? He attempted to eliminate the problem before it became a problem. He responded like people in positions of power all too frequently respond. He was so concerned with the preservation of his power and authority and keeping the status quo that he was even willing to slaughter innocent children to accomplish that goal. If you read on in Matthew chapter 2, after our pericope ends today, in fact, just four verses later, verse 16, you will see that Herod orders the execution of all male children two years old and younger who were born in the vicinity of Bethlehem. Herod's motivation was fear. Love and fear can liberate us and can also keep us captive. They are great motivators, and I wonder, which one do you follow the most in your life? Love or fear? It's a struggle for sure, especially when these two lowest common motivational denominators are put up against each other in a toe-to-toe -to -toe go around. But I ask you again today, as 2019 begins, which one do you follow the most in your life? Love or fear? In this story, and in much of my experience of life, love usually ends up changing things for the better, while fear clings for things to stay the same. Fear keeps my feet in my sneakers and out of a bungee cord, which is right. Fear of rejection never gets you off your behind to ask the question. Fear of high expectations leads you to a disappointing hope that you can never let loose or let soar. Fear focuses on you and only what is right, only you and what is right in front of your nose. Fear makes you want to fight. Fear makes you want to flee. Fear causes me to question everything and everyone around me to the third degree. Just to satisfy me, fear. Psh, all right? Fear tells you you're not good enough. Fear tells you you're not right. Fear tells you you're not strong enough to put up a fight. Fear tells you that you're not worthy. Fear tells you that you're not loved, that you're not beautiful, that you'll never be enough. Fear tells you that you are troubled and that you'll forever be alone. Fear tells you that you should run away because you'll never find a home. Fear tells you that you're dirty. Fear tells you that you should be ashamed. Fear tells you that you're probably the one, the one 
that the grace that the God, that preacher talks about every Sunday, that you're probably the one that can never change. But I'm here to tell you that fear may scare you, but love has another word for you, and his name is Jesus. You see, fear wants you to run and hide, but love shows up and says, I'll always be by your side. Love says, you messed up, well, so have I. Let's hold on to each other and give it another try. Love drives people to prayer, care, and share. Love tells us to put our selfishness aside, let go of pride, and work hard for our neighbor, for our God, to comfort our neighbor when they're in pain and cry, no matter how they've tried and no matter how many times they have backslided. No matter where they're from or what they look like, or even what color their hair is dyed, love is the answer. Love finds a way forward. And let me say this to you who need to hear it now. Love knows no distance because love goes the distance. Love comes from heaven to earth for you. Love goes to hell and back for you. And love is so deep, so deep for you. And I said you, that the person and the person beside you and the person who's not here and even the person on this Sunday morning who's sitting at home right now and having a beer, love motivated God and to send Jesus, Jesus, to die, to rise again from the dead, thus changing the destination of our souls forever. The question is today, the question is for this year, what motivates you? Love or fear? Fear drove Herod the Great to murder children. Love drove Jesus to rebuke his own disciples when they held back the children and he said, let the children come unto me and suffer them not. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Herod's fear left blood on his hands. Jesus willingly went to the cross with his arms wide open, with blood dripping from his hands, not for his sins, for he was sinless, but for the forgiveness of our sins. For it is by God's love and grace through faith in Jesus Christ that we are saved. My friends, this epiphany, as you look at today, the week ahead of you, the month, the year, take a look at what has motivated you in the past. In the Bible, look at your own motivation. And may the love of God shine bright for you leading you like the Magi star. May God's love be your greatest motivation. Amen.